Rubicon me Adriatic Kelmendin per krahet nga Albimol, Interex, Palma dhe Arioni Company. Mësafiri mi sot të më shëndërë fëtë reporterët me të njohur në bota i ka dokumentuar shumë gjarit të rëndësishme, por bitë gjitha është të njohur për fotografit e ti të luftës. A i ka shkuar në rëth 25 vende ku ka pasur konflikt duke siel të bota të mere që ka par atje. Ka punuar shumë dhe gjatë luftës në Kosovë dhe luftra të tjera në ishtë Jugoslavi dhe është autor i shumë imajëve që ne i kemi paru se i shojmë, ka përfunduar edhe duke dëshmua në tribunal ndërkomtar të krimeve të luftës për ishë Jugoslavin, për krime që ka bërë Arkani. Êshtë i njohërë dhe për fotën me Arkanin me Tiger në një nga masakra që janë kryer në Bosnë. Sot e kemi në Rubikon dhe do të diskutojmë për karierën e ti. Mr. Ron Haviv, thanks for coming to Rubikon. A pleasure, thank you. So you documented 25 conflicts around the world. So I've been working as a journalist during the Kosovo War for like 10 months, but uh, one question remains. So how can you document all those atrocities and continue working and stay sane? Well, I guess the definition of sane is really uh, up, up to you how you define it. But I think that one of the things that has made it not easier, but motivated me to continue to work is that I've seen the impact after doing this for more than 30 years. I've seen the impact of photography. I've seen also the limitations. But when I see some of my work actually having a good effect, uh, it encourages me to keep going. Mm -hmm. And what do you call a good effect? Well, I think simply that the photographs can play a role in communication. They can inform. Uh, they can be there for not only citizenry, but also governments to help make, the, make decisions about what they're doing. Uh, I think that everything works together, and journalism, for sure, plays a role in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the writing is one thing, then documented with, with a camera is something else. So images can stay on your mind sometime almost forever. So what do you look to, to have in an image, in the photograph that you take? What's the best shot for you? Well, that, that's a great question. I, th I think that is exactly that. You want your imagery to be remembered. That is the goal, and to be understood, mm -hmm. and for the content to be appreciated. So it's a combination of simply the aesthetics of photography, mm -hmm. using light, uh, color, or black and white, making these choices, the type of lens, the type of camera, has an impact. And then being able to kind of capture a moment that I feel uh, creates an intimacy between the viewer and the image. That there's a relationship between the viewer and the image. I really try very hard to, in some ways, seduce the viewer into the photograph so they can't look away. Uh, sometimes I'm criticized for what's called uh, war porn, making things that are very horrible look too beautiful, but it's very deliberate. I, I want people to look, I want them to be engaged, I want them to appreciate the story of what they're seeing in the photograph. And as you mentioned, so sometimes it's a thin line of what you can show from the war, because some images can be really brutal and uh, hard to see for many people. So where is your, do you have a red line? I think it's a case by case uh, situation, but basically if, if I take a photograph and you're as a viewer going to swipe or change the page immediately and not even register mm -hmm. the photograph because it's too hard to look at, then the photograph fails. So I have to find a way to be able to tell the story of that victim, of that situation in a way that you're going to engage. And it's, again, it's like using the art of photography to be able to do that. And if I can do that well, I'm, I'm successful. Mm -hmm. And how did you end up with photography and war journalism in particular? Uh, to be honest with you, I, I never thought I was going to be a photographer when I was a child. I studied to be a writer, to be a journalist, and at some point I wound up saying, you know, maybe I'd rather tell stories with photographs. And the first place I went to, uh, I was given a plane ticket by a colleague to go to Panama, a country in Central America that was holding elections by a dictator. And I took a photograph. Why you got, why you got that, that ticket? You were working with a newspaper or what? Uh, I was freelancing for AFP, for a wire service, and a friend of mine had an extra ticket and said, hey, 
um, I said I wanted to go, and he gave me a ticket. And I found myself uh, documenting a dictatorship that was, was starting to fall apart. And I took a photograph of... It, what year was it? It was 1989, yeah. this was the beginning of my career in Panama. And the dictator of Panama, General Manuel Noriega, was holding elections, which he lost. He then canceled the elections, and the would-be victors came onto the streets to start an uprising. And I photographed the vice president-elect covered in blood, being beaten up by a paramilitary supporter of the dictator. The mm -hmm. photograph wound up on the cover of Time and Newsweek and US News and Stern and Perry Match and so on. And seven months later, when the United States invaded Panama, mm -hmm. the president of the United States spoke about the photograph as one of the justifications for the war. And it wasn't that I totally agreed so with it. But your photograph was taken as a justification to intervene. Yes. In a speech to the nation, mm -hmm. he, the president talked about the photographs. Mm -hmm. And it was then that I understood the, the power of photography, what it could do mm -hmm. by being part of this communication change by chain, by influencing, by showing, by educating. And I thought that, wow, that's an amazing privilege to be able to do that and an amazing way to spend my time. And how did you continue then? 1989, the world changed, for those of you that remember. Yep. Berlin Wall came down, I was there for that. I was in China after Tiananmen Square. So you were for the uh, tearing down the Berlin Wall? Yeah, mm -hmm. and I was able to sort to see the ability to document history in the way that the world was changing. And it was you know, very exciting. And then really shortly after that, by 91, I read about a small article in, in the New York Times about this place called Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. a place everybody thought was going to make this amazing transition in post-Soviet times. But they were talking about possible problems, possible violence, and, and I went off to Slovenia and documented their very brief uh, war of independence and then realized you, that... You started with those clashes in Slovenia that I lasted did. like two weeks. Yeah. So you were there. I was there for that. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, it, at least to myself and many of my colleagues, it seemed very apparent what was going to happen step by step, unless there was intervention and so on. Croatia would be next, then Bosnia, and then the one thing that everybody was afraid of was, was Kosovo. So the course of the next 10 years, I was in this region for more than five years. Back then, everyone was waiting for something to happen in Kosovo, but Kosovo was postponed. <laughs> yeah. So do you usually choose where to go, or it is the assignment of the, uh, where you work, or you always freelancing? I'm always freelancing. I had a, during the breakup of Yugoslavia, I had a long-term relationship with Newsweek. Mm -hmm. So most of my work was done for Newsweek. But um, I have the ability, having never had an actual job, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to choose uh, stories that I feel are important, stories that I want uh, to go and, and be able to show the world what's happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, the stories uh, that you, you choose, like the pictures that you choose that end up in the war journal Blood and Honey, uh, which documented war crimes in Yugoslavia. So you, you talk about this book also in, in Kosovo. What is there to say about this book? Well, I think after documenting the conflict, um, basically right, right till before Kosovo, I realized that uh, there was a lot of imagery that had not been seen. I wanted to create a book of evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, this was incredibly important. The, the role of photography is evidence to hold people accountable for their actions and also hold people accountable for their inactions. Mm -hmm. And so once the conflict in Kosovo was ended and once Milosevic had been taken to The Hague, it seemed like the right time uh, to do a book to ensure that all my work existed together, but also to be able to make a statement about what happened in the former Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. And one of the most well-known photos, you have many, of course, and we're going to discuss some of them, is this one. This story sadly ended badly. So did. can you tell us the story behind this photograph? So this is a picture from, from Bosnia, from a town called Bielina. Mm -hmm. It was the first kind of town to, to start fighting just over the border from Serbia and Bosnia. I arrived uh, just at the beginning when this, basically the Serbians were fighting against the Bosniaks, the butcher against the, the banker and so on, um, just much like the war had started in Croatia. By the fourth or fifth day of the war, I was standing around with some, some people and a convoy arrived with a jeep and a bus and so on. And Arkan, uh, the leader of the paramilitary group known as the Tigers, jumps out and says, 
I'm here to liberate the town of Muslim fundamentalists. Mm -hmm. Not that there was any evidence that there were Muslim fundamentalists, but that's what he had said. I had photographed Archon during the conflict in uh, Croatia. I took a photograph of him holding up a baby tiger that he really yeah, liked. Yeah, we're going to show later on, and I, I, I would, would like to have a story behind sure. it. So it's really interesting. So I asked, I asked him for permission to go off with uh, his unit, and he said, oh, go off, off with these guys, and off we went. And we moved through the town, a lot of outgoing gunfire, almost no incoming gunfire, or if any at all. We arrived at a mosque. Uh, the paramilitaries went into the mosque. They took down the Islamic flag. They put up the Serbian flag. And after they posed for a photograph holding up the Islamic flag, I heard some noise from another room. And I went to the other room, and there was this, this man. Uh, his name is Harush Zabiri. He's Macedonian and Albanian, working in Bosnia. He was working in a pizza shop across the street from the mosque. So and he's Albanian from Macedonia who was working in Bosnia. Correct. And they, had, they took out the Serbian uh, paramilitaries, took his ID, and they were showing me, they're going, Kosovo, Kosovo, Kosovo. Mm. Completely frantic, completely furious. Mm. Uh, at that point, I didn't even totally understand what Kosovo meant uh, to the Serbs. So, so it added fuel to the fire when they question. realized that he's a Kosovar. Or, or that I mean, meant immediately, whether he was or not, and I don't think he was, that he was a fighter. Mm. So he was guilty. So they concluded no immediately. he should be a fighter. Immediately. Mm -hmm. So essentially, we're seeing here Harush. There was nothing that I could do to, to help him. Mm -hmm. But I thought the only thing I could do was to photograph him with the soldiers so they knew that there was photographic evidence that would hopefully stop them from, from doing anything to him. So, so they, they allowed you to photograph him? or you, you... They were moving. This is kind of towards the end, of going back to the headquarters. I went to take a photograph. They threw him to the ground, and Harush put his hands up. It was essentially, to me, uh, the way that I read it, to, 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 to help him. And all I could do was, was, was to take this photograph. Mm -hmm. And later, he was executed. Well, what happened next was we went back to the headquarters, uh, the temporary headquarters of the Tigers, and I was waiting for permission to leave the town. And I heard a great crash, and Harush came flying out of a window. Uh, second or third floor, landed on the ground. Amazingly, he survived. They doused him with water. They said they were baptizing him, and I was able to photograph all of this. And then they dragged him back into the house. Mm -hmm. Moments later, Archon arrived. Uh, somebody told him what I had just done. Archon came up to me and said, I need all your film. We argued for a while, but eventually I gave up my film. The next day when I went back, I went to the house. I went to the hospital. I went um, anywhere I could to see where Harush was. Obviously, I didn't know his name at the time and so on. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea what happened to him until 2003 when I got a Facebook message from one of his family members who said, Harush's body has been found. He's been identified through DNA. He was found in the river, uh, and he's been brought home, and he's been buried. Mm. Such a sad story. Mm -hmm. And uh, I understood that you met, actually, his family. I did. I went to Macedonia. I met with the family. And to be honest with you, I wasn't really sure what would happen when I met them. I, I assumed that they were going to be very angry, mm -hmm. that they were going to be upset that I couldn't save him, that all I did was take a photograph. And when I arrived, they actually took out a box of photographs of this picture in the many publications around the world. And they said that while they understood there was nothing I could do, that they felt that his death actually had impact, that people knew what happened. It was used in the war crimes tribunal to indict people. Uh, and it, it actually had some meaning that he didn't become just an unknown. And he lives on in a very horrible photograph, but he does live on. Mm -hmm. Yep. Are we going to see another photograph in the meanwhile if we will have the chance to have the other, the other picture of Hayrush with the water on his head? So, uh, That's not my photograph, by the way. Yes, but just to, to, to yep. link the two. So what are we seeing here? This is in, in uh, Vukovar? No, this is also from Bielina. This oh. is, so meanwhile, while yes. Harush was literally across the street in the mosque, mm -hmm. across the street is a house surrounded by um, this wall where many people were hiding in the basement of this house. Mm -hmm. The house was owned by um, the Shabanoviches, which is um, the woman lying uh, closest to the wall. Uh, the two other people, the man uh, and the woman, are the Paijetis, also Macedonian Albanians. Um, they were brought out first, then they were executed. 
then Tifa Shabanovich was brought out and she was executed uh, as well. The whole time um, they're doing this, they know that I'm there, they're screaming at me, don't take any photographs, don't take any photographs. But I felt that uh, I, if I couldn't save them, I could not witness a war crime and not have some photographic evidence mm -hmm. of, of what happened. Uh, something similar happened to me during the war in Croatia in Vukovar where I wasn't able to do anything and I made a promise to myself never to allow that to happen again. So at this point, I just wanted a photograph of the paramilitaries walking past the victims. And from my left, and I don't think they saw me taking the photograph, this, this main soldier here, who later was identified as Serjan Golubovic. Uh, he's a Serjan Golubovic. DJ in Belgrade. Young, he was very young at the time, probably. I read an article he, recently. It was, he's working as a DJ in Belgrade he now. Is. Rolling, Stone, Rolling Stone did an article yes. um, about the photograph and, mm -hmm. and its authenticity and so on. And he, this is what happened. And I was able to, to, to capture this photograph and it became, very quickly it became a symbol of what was really not even really known at that point about this idea of ethnic cleansing, about what was, uh, about what was going on. Mm. And this photograph has now continued to live on and on in many, in many, many different ways. Mm. Let's see another photograph. Uh, yes, this is the picture that I referred to. So this is Hayrush, right? This is Hayrush. This is a photograph uh, of them, ba quote unquote, baptizing him. It was taken by an AP photographer who was there as well that day, and he was allowed to keep keep his film. Mm -hmm. And let's see another photograph. What do we see here? Uh, now we're this switching. Is this is from Croatia. Croatia. Yeah. This is from Vukovar. Uh, also, very similar uh, to Bielina, I was allowed to travel with the Serbian forces as they, quote unquote, liberated Vukovar from, from the Croatians, mm -hmm. uh, where there were summary executions, ethnic cleansing, and, and there's, of course, a war crime that happened uh, at the hospital. Uh, so again, uh, especially now, this is 1991, where most of the world, especially in America, not paying attention to the former Yugoslavia, not really caring, not understanding uh, what was going on. And it was my attempt, as well as my colleagues, to try to keep reminding them by documenting things such as Vukovar uh, and showing how brutal uh, this conflict was, especially, most importantly, on civilians. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the most uh, videoed wars uh, at that time, the Bosnian War. So it, there were no, uh, the, no bigger amount of images that came out of any war before than from Bosnia. So you were one of the, those people telling to the world what is going on. So it's so important also for politicians and public opinion in other countries to see what is going on so they can react to stop the atrocities. Absolutely. One of the things, certainly in the United States, but I think around the world, people are taught uh, when they're in school about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. that what came out of that was this idea about never again, never again will there be another genocide, never again will such atrocities uh, occur. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I've documented now three genocides uh, during my career, and there have been many, many more uh, between World War II uh, and when I started as a photographer. And it is the photographs and the journalism that hold people responsible. So quite simply, what they did during World War II was they said, we didn't know. That's no longer possible. Mm -hmm. Now you look at Ukraine, you look at Bucha, you look at uh, other places. You, say, you, can't, you can't say that. It, you are seeing it. We are providing you the imagery. If you say you don't know, no. You're not acting. You're not doing anything. So by, by hearing you saying this, it's a profession, but also a mission that you put to yourself. So to show the world what is going on, to show to the people on power that what is going on and that they should react. Exactly, and it's regardless of, I'm not on one side versus the other, I'm trying to show whatever I'm able to show, but at the same time, I'm often criticized, like, you showed this side, why didn't you show yes. our side? Yep. It's fair, but I'm, I'm one person, I'm showing you my, as a, as a viewer, you're seeing my interpretation of what's happening, and now your responsibility as a viewer is to go and look at something else from the other side, and you make a determination mm -hmm. about what you think is going on. But it's important for people like myself um, to continue to go in places like Ukraine and other places, mm -hmm. Gaza and so on, to show the world what's happening. And how, how important is the access? Because some, sometimes you just cannot go alone on the field. So sometimes you need to 
go with, with the troops or with the army that is intervening. So it's the term embedded journalism. So sometimes that is seen as kind of biased. So have you found yourself in those situations? For example, yes. it was in, in uh, Afghanistan, for example, it was really big to talk about what sides we are seeing more. So we are not seeing the suffering of, of, of the Afghans, people. but we are seeing only the suffer from the Western people. Well, first, there's several answers to that question. Yeah. The first part is, the, my role as a photographer is essentially to be embedded in any situation, because embedded means that you are basically photographing things naturally as they happen, because you're there. People know that you're there and they don't care and they let you do whatever you can. Mm -hmm. So that's always the goal is to kind of be able to like show the world as natural as possible without my interference. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with the military, let's say using the American military, for example, being embedded, I was embedded with the Marines and so on. Uh, there, there are some limitations that you accept, in, but at the same time, it's my job to ensure that I'm not, even though I'm American, that I'm not showing a war, if there's a war crime committed by an American, I photograph that. If there's a war crime committed by somebody else, I'm going to photograph that as well, if I can. But access, access is key. And access even here during the war in Kosovo, at times, was a very big problem. Mm -hmm. The KLA did not understand what the role of, of journalists was. Not all of them, and at times it changed back and forth. But so our you, ability, you, and I'm not talking about yeah. just trying to photograph a guy with a gun. I'm talking about like, I need access to this village to see what happened. I need to show people what's going on. But sometimes everybody thinks that the person with the camera is the enemy because they're afraid of showing what's going on. Mm. And the, there's suspicion always. So always. Who are you going to show those photographs? Right. Are you spying for someone? But now, now versus especially the 1990s, we are in a, everybody is a photographer. Yeah. Everybody has the a Social camera. media and everything. Exactly, so and now you, when you talked about Bosnia being one of the most photographed wars, Ukraine has suppressed that yeah. by 100,000 times. It's incredible, it's gonna be the most visually documented place. But even in Ukraine, there are limits on where they'll allow journalists to work. If you notice, there's very little combat um, imagery from Ukraine from journalists because we're allowed to go to a certain point and then the Ukrainians stop us. And that could wind up being a disadvantage for them because if journalists are not able to be able to document everything, they go, they'll stop coming to cover the story. And if they stop covering the story, things like aid start to disappear and it's a chain reaction. Mm. Yeah, so it's not wise to discourage journalists. I, overall, I don't think it is. I mean, everything has to be done with, with, within some sort of structure, but, but it, it is important to let the world see, see what's happening. Okay, we're gonna see another story, another image. So, so this is, um, so towards the end of the war in Bosnia, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Bosnians were winning. And this is a, this is a soldier, um, Sadam Madanovic, um, who basically was fighting for to take back his village, uh, which he did. This is his family home. And he had just realized that over 60 members of his family were killed and are buried uh, where, where he's standing. At this exact day, at, at, at this moment, he understood what happened to his family? And he, and he, and he collapsed, overwhelmed uh, by grief. He had, this is the first time back in the village since he, since he fled mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning of the war in 1992. This is 1995. Uh, the Bosnians are, are winning the war. Actually, the war ends within a week or two after this photograph was taken. Mm -hmm. Let's see another photograph. So this is Kosovo. This is right? from Kosovo. Uh, this is from Drenica. Um, this is what unfortunately was a very common, common scene as the war um, continued of, of homes being burned, people being ethnically cleansed out of their village, mm -hmm. being pushed into the mountains and so on. And this is the woman reacting uh, to a home being burnt. Mm -hmm. And you were like, it was a regular working day for you. You were there for a certain story or? I was documenting what was going on here. And at some points it was simply as simple as like looking for where the smoke was. And that's where we would find, find the conflict. Or where, if we were driving, there was a Serbian checkpoint. We couldn't go there. We would try to find a way to go around it to be able to ensure that there was a witness to what was happening to the Kosovars. Mm -hmm. We're going to see another image. This is, I think, you know, it's quite a powerful image. Uh, this is uh, a bit complicated. It's, it's the burnt remains um, 
uh, of, a, of a man in Jakova uh, um, named Kolad Dusmani. Uh, he was killed during, during the NATO bombing. What was the name? Kola Dusmani. And, uh, and, his, and basically, because of the intensity of the heat and the fire, this basically ash outline uh, was, was left in the, I think, in the living room of, of the home. Mm-hmm. And we found it um, after, once we went back in with the NATO, once liberation had occurred, this was some of the evidence that we found of the different mm-hmm. uh, crimes and atrocities that occurred um, while there were no eyes, while, while no journalists. So the there. photograph was taken after the troops went in, NATO troops. After NATO troops went in, that's correct. Okay. This is also very published photograph of important Yeah, this is probably days. within, I don't know, maybe half an hour, 20 minutes of uh, the German troops entering um, and people celebrating, the, pe- the people that stayed, the people that survived. Uh, the 25 years ago. 25 years ago this week, yeah. June 12th. Yeah, mm. exactly. So finally you saw some joy. Yes, which, which was, you know, even though we saw some joy in, in the refugee camps and so on, but this is people knowing that the war was over, people knowing that their relatives were coming back, people knowing that their lives were no longer at risk. Uh, it was an amazing scene. There was everywhere, there was some scene like this throughout the night, people jumping on NATO vehicles, celebrating with the soldiers. Obviously, I'm not old enough to have been in Paris when it was liberated, but I assume it was something very, very similar uh, to this. Mm-hmm. And we're going to go to one uh, picture of yours that had so many articles written about it. So from Rolling Stone and all over. So Arkan, the infamous Arkan, holding a tiger. He called his unit tigers and he wanted to show to the world that he's strongest tiger. So it was 92 in Bosnia. Can no, the soldier was 1991 in Croatia. In Croatia, yes. So he had a, um, his headquarters were in Erdut, mm-hmm. and he was involved in a lot of different fighting. So we were always trying to get access to go and document whatever he was doing. So myself and my colleague Alexandre Boula, an amazing French photographer, uh, we went together um, to ask him for permission to go, and he said no. Mm-hmm. So we said, well, could we do a portrait of you? Now, Archon spoke multiple languages, felt that he was always in control of the press and in control of his image, but he also really loved beautiful women. And Alexandra happened to be a beautiful woman as well as an amazing photographer. Mm -hmm. And so he wanted to impress her. So he said, I'll I'll set up a portrait for you. So he got all his men to get on top of a tank, put on their balaclavas, and he stood in front of it. And just before I'm about to take the photograph, somebody hands him a baby tiger that he had liberated from a Croatian zoo. Mm -hmm. He then made the photograph into a poster, uh, and then I was able to use that photograph um, as a excuse to be able to work with him in Bosnia just a few months later. So he was actually proud of this photograph? Very proud. No, it's a good representation of him and his men without question. Mm. So you made him famous or infamous, even more, he was famous, infamous even before because he was a well-known criminal, but this got his, uh, the attention of the whole world. Indeed, and for him it was, you know, he wanted to show himself as a strong Serbian warrior and so on, so this worked very well in his, uh, in his mind. But of course the photograph is how you interpret it. Some people look at it and think it's very, he's very silly and mm-hmm. it just depends on your perspective. But your history with Arkan didn't end here. So you've been in trouble with him even later on. I know the story when you came to Kosovo, then you went to Belgrade, and he was kind of following you around. So after the photograph from Bielina of his men uh, executing those people, uh, he supposedly got into a lot of trouble with Belgrade. They they were very upset. Not upset that the executions happened, but upset that they were photographed. And he put me on what was known as some sort of death list. And in fact, a photographer who looked a little bit like me was arrested outside of Sarajevo when they thought that he was, was me. And then for basically the next um, eight years or so, I was always constantly trying to avoid, avoid him. I almost ran into him at the Grand Hotel in Pristina. Mm. Um, when was that? 
that was in, in 98. Uh, I, I was in the parking lot going back to my room. I got a phone call. Don't come into the hotel. Archon, Archon's in the lobby. Mm -hmm. Then um, when the day of the NATO bombing started, I was deciding, should I try to stay? Should I go? And uh, I got a phone call. The Tigers are coming. You don't want to be anywhere near there. So I say, OK, I'll go to Belgrade and then try to see what I can get back into Kosovo. Mm. I go to Belgrade, I go to the Intercontinental, I get a phone call again in the parking lot. Don't come into the lobby, Archon's here, he never went to, Kos he never went to Kosovo. Mm -hmm. In 1994, I was arrested by Serbs, taken prisoner uh, for a number of days, and luckily, every day I was waiting for somebody to, to realize who I was and to hand me over to Archon, but luckily, uh, the governments negotiated for my release before they figured it out. But I was told by Serbian colleagues that he was always very angry and always one step behind, and especially as the tribunal came into effect, that I was one of the few Western journalists that could actually testify against him. Mm -hmm. And actually, Arkan was killed later on in that intercontinental he hotel. Was, indeed. So what were you thinking when you heard the news first? I think in some ways, Justice was served, but I think in other ways it would have prefer it would been preferable, not for myself, but I think for many of his victims, had he been tried for his crimes and gone to jail and not had sort of the easy way out and, and been killed immediately. And also easy way out, can we say that for Slobodan Milosevic as well? He died in his cell, not it could be said. for the final it verdict? It could be said as well. Mm -hmm. And how was your experience for, for testifying at the hate tribunal? Well, I, I was never, um, I never actually, I gave testimony for the veracity of the photographs. I've also testified uh, at the Serbian war crimes uh, tribunal as well to justify the photographs and so on. But the photographs were used in multiple ways uh, for indictments as well as convictions. In fact, even the last trial right before the Hague finished, uh, they were used again uh, to help convict people of war crimes. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us more about your time in, in Kosovo? So when was the first time you came when a war started in Kosovo? Where did you go? Who did you meet? So I came early in, in 1998 uh, when things started to change from the protests and, and so on. Obviously, I've been paying attention to Kosovo throughout the breakup mm -hmm. of Yugoslavia. After the Yashari massacre or before? Just after the Yashari massacre. Mm -hmm. And it became apparent that things were escalating quite quickly and it seemed like they were gonna fall into the same pattern that I had already witnessed. So I came to Pristina, based out of Pristina, and, and spent a lot of time moving from here, using this as the headquarters, like many journalists, staying mm -hmm. at the Grand Hotel and, and going and, and covering. Um, as, I, as things escalated, meeting with the KLA, meeting with commanders, uh, meeting with the people that were suffering, trying to understand uh, what was happening. One of the things that I think is often not really discussed, but quite amazing, was that in order for any international journalist to come to Kosovo, we needed permission from the Serbian government. Yep. We needed a visa, we needed credentials. And for some reason, they kept letting us come. Instead of just shutting it down and saying no journalists allowed and everything would have been left only to the local journalists, they allowed the international media to come. And I think that one of the things that happened here in Kosovo uh, is that because we kept coming, uh, and working in partnership with the Kosovo journalists, we were able to really ensure that Kosovo was not going to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. So the Serbs made that mistake that helped us in the end? I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. And so you were staying or coming and going depending on the uh, intensity of the conflict? Yes, I would maybe come for a month, go, go somewhere else, or come back home for a few weeks and then come back again. It would just kind of go, go up and down until until basically the, the, the final days. And then the final days, I spent seven months from expulsion from Pristina uh, to Montenegro, to Albania, to Macedonia, and then back, and then I went back in a little bit with the KLA, and then back in uh, again with the final push from NATO. So you haven't been into Kosovo during the bombardment, NATO bombardment? I was over the border, back and forth, but never never very much, um, no, mm -hmm. not, not as much as other people had. And what was your experience with Serbian forces, checkpoints, and also with the KLA? You mentioned them earlier, that they sometimes didn't understand the importance of Western journalists, like international reporters. 
You know, it, it, with the Serbs, it depended who you were dealing with. If you were dealing with professional police and so on, they at times were accessible and, and allowed you to work. And other times they could be you know, quite brutal, um, as they ha were in other, other places. Uh, the army was a little bit more, more chaotic and, and, and different. And in terms of the KLA, it was, um, there were times when they understood what, what we were doing and they allowed us access because they, they wanted the story to go out. And there were other times when they were very rigid and it was very difficult uh, to work as well. Do you remember the names of the people, like commanders or? I was with Ramush for a while and, and other, other, other people. Um, you know, there was uh, different, different units, different, different people. I was with also with a lot of the diaspora, uh, Kosovars that were coming from America that were bringing in weaponry. So I was in Byram Suri and other places kind of understanding how the, the war mechanism worked uh, and, and also you know, experiencing kind of the, the conflict from, from that perspective as well. Mm. And how do you compare what happened in Kosovo with other conflicts that happened in former Yugoslavia. So the intensity, the brutality, the organization of like forces, uh, fate of the people, massacres, uh, expulsion. I think that uh, the KLA learned a lot of lessons from the previous um, wars. They learned what worked, especially in terms of public relations. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, also helped intensify things uh, much more quickly, or much quicker. Uh, I think that the ethnic cleansing that took place here is not compared to, to anything incredible. The numbers are 800,000 people being pushed out of their homes mm -hmm. and you know, coming over and over again to Albania, to Macedonia, and, and so on is, is one of the most remarkable, horrific scenes that I've ever photographed and never ever witnessed. So I think that Kosovo unfortunately stands out in that way in, in a very uh, unique, unique way. I think uh, that um, Kosovo without question benefited from, from Bosnia. And I know this Kosovo because- Kosovo benefited from Bosnia. Yeah, and I know this because um, also I, I document politics in America. So in 2000, there was an election uh, with Al Gore running for president. So I spent a lot of time with him and I shared my work from Kosovo with him. And he spoke about what it was like um, for him and Bill Clinton during the time in Kosovo. And he said, you know, that the journalism and especially the imagery that when they had to witness the same horrific images of ethnic cleansing, of execution of civilians, and all these things that they had thought they would never see again after Dayton, once again witnessing it, that Milosevic had promised to stop, they were essentially motivated, embarrassed, however you want to term it, but they realized that they had to act. There was no way that they could not act uh, in Kosovo. And so the Kosovars, as much as they suffered, also benefited for that particular thing. Mm -hmm. And of course, many times I would reckon you found yourself in trouble. So were there times that you were really afraid of for your life? Well, afraid for my life, uh, certainly like, like many civilians being um, shelling or gunfire and so on is as kind of part of the risk of doing this work. But you know, many arrests, being arrested by, by Serbian forces almost every couple of days, who are you, being held to this police station and so on. And then, um, you know, those, those, those things are, 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 are difficult. And then sometimes the arrests are, are more serious. Mm -hmm. Like when I was in prison for three or four days uh, and I had to have a government negotiate for my release. So I've been incredibly lucky. Obviously I'm not dead. And of course I haven't been wounded as well. And many of my colleagues, including uh, many of the Kosovo journalists, you know, paid, paid with their life for what they were doing, trying to make sure that the world knew what was happening here. And of course you get this, uh, this question all the time, is it worth it? When people say you can go and like shoot politics, not to go to places of conflict. If I ask you, was it worth it? Well, I think in retrospect, given that I'm alive and well, I can say yes, but each time it is, it is a conversation you have, like what kind of risks am I willing to take? You take different risks when you're 25 versus when you're 50. But that being said, I was in Ukraine for many months covering that war because I thought it's important that we go and do this. It's important that the world knows what's happening. And I'm a big believer in the, the role of journalism, especially the role of journalism 
uh, and specifically photojournalism in democracies and playing a very positive role in that. It's very, very key, I think, to a successful country. Mm -hmm. And uh, having witnessed uh, the war in Bosnia, so we saw the resolution being adopted uh, recently at the UN to, to name uh, July 11th International Day of uh, Reflection and Commemoration uh, for genocide in Srebrenica. So how do you see that? I think it's important. I think that twofold, that I think that the past should preferably remain in the past to a degree. But at the same time, one cannot forget what happened, simply to try to avoid the same mistakes. Now we see here, again, rhetoric on this side, rhetoric on that side, that are mimicking what we heard in the 90s, and often coming from people that were born after the war and don't understand uh, what the conflict meant and how a genocide like Srebrenica can happen. So these things can't be buried. They have to be understood. They have to be taken into account. They can't be denied when it's so obvious that it's true. And they have to be part of a collective history. If this region is going to move on as a group, if people are going to become, countries are going to become part of the EU and so on, things have to be accepted. If Germans can do it with what happened in World War II, everybody can do it. But it's incredibly important. And, and one of the things that's important about the commemoration of Srebrenica and now obviously this announcement and so on is that this is what happens when everything goes wrong. You know, and this can happen to anybody. It doesn't have to be Yugoslavia. It doesn't have to be Africa. It could be the United States. Obviously, Ukraine and Russia, another example. So the question is, where, as human beings, do we learn our lessons? Because when the war was happening here, the conversation was always, I can't believe there's another war in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Now the converse in Europe. And now the conversation is, I can't believe there's another war in Europe in the 21st century. And uh, as a war journalist that witnessed like 25 conflicts, do you go when you see some news on television, wow, well, this is going to end up badly, so probably I will need to go there soon. So you have this incredible experience so you can sense when there's trouble. I think you can see often the, the steps that are being taken, what, is, what will occur, where things will go wrong. Uh, and when there will be need for people to pay attention. In today's world now, it is very difficult to get the attention of the public for more than a moment or two. Mm -hmm. So for myself, I have to find the right time, the right story, the right way to tell that story in order for there to be some sort of impact for people to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. So for instance, now people are paying attention to Ukraine and people are paying attention to Gaza. But meanwhile, in Sudan, the situation is much worse. Mm -hmm. uh, Famine is real. Millions more people at risk for famine. The war is killing more people. But there's no journalism there. Nobody cares. Nobody's paying attention. And this is, this is one of the problems that we have. Yes, and, and you touched uh, this very sensitive question. So how to tell to the world where some conflicts are happening? Because you mentioned Sudan. And it's sometimes this discussion among us journalists. What do we cover? So where do we pay more attention? So sometimes you feel the burden of if I'm uh, seeing everyone equal, so if some uh, suffering somewhere hurts me more than some suffering elsewhere, so how to deal with all this? So how to choose what to put in the agenda of the news? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, at some point, there. There's also a chain within the newsroom and there are other people or the magazine or, or so ever. My, my role is a little bit more simple. This is important. I'm going to go document, come back with the work, send the work, and try to convince people that it's important. Mm -hmm. The different decisions of when we're going to put Sudan on the front page versus Haiti versus Gaza versus Ukraine um, are different conversations. But most importantly, they're based on what you, the audience, wants to see. And if, if the magazines, newspapers, websites, TikTok, whoever understand that you want to be kept informed of what's happening in the world, they will provide you that information. If they think all you care about are recipes, dancing, your lunch, so on on Instagram, Snapchat, whatever, then that's what you'll see. I think while the world doesn't need to be totally engaged with war every day or crisis every day, as citizens of the world where we are all connected, and 
people here in Kosovo know that what happens here um, can be affected by America and other places, we are connected. We are all connected, more now than ever before. So we need to be a little bit more responsible as, as citizens of the world. And you've been to Gaza, you've been to Sudan? I've been to Sudan. Gaza, unfortunately, at this point, no international journalists are allowed, but I was in Israel uh, after October 7th, mm -hmm. portraying what happened on the Israeli side. But kudos and credit, of course, to the Palestinian journalists who have risked their lives trying to tell the story of, of what's going on uh, in Gaza, mm -hmm. which is an incredibly difficult situation, without question. And how is it with you returning 25 years after the liberation of Kosovo, after freedom came to Kosovo, meeting with, with friends, with people that you probably worked before? Uh, what's the feel? I think it's, it's fantastic. I think because I, I feel now, of course, speaking as an outsider, I don't know the inner workings of Kosovo, but to the outside eye, um, it, Kosovo seems like it's on the right direction. When maybe you look at it a little bit toward, compared to Bosnia, which feels like it's, they definitely have not left the 1990s. And here it feels like, for the most part, Kosovo has and they're looking forward. So that means, I think, to some degree, the sacrifices uh, that were made, while of course nobody wants to lose somebody and so on, at least the people that, that lost their lives here can feel like you know, the country has benefited. It's a country, first of all, right? Mm -hmm. And that it's been uh, recognized by many people and so on. And that's, that's, that's very positive. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's also very important to me is that I have co-founded a foundation called the Seven Foundation with Gary Knight. Uh, we have uh, offices in Sarajevo and in France. And I, one of our goals is that we are uh, dedicated to teaching visual journalism free of charge to, um, to photographers, visual journalists from underrepresented communities mm -hmm. around the world. And we've started teaching here in Kosovo. And why are we teaching here? Because we believe that, especially today in the world of artificial intelligence and this idea of fake news, that journalism and especially photography, photojournalists, need to be able to tell stories with integrity, with, with rules, with um, the pursuit of truth, because it is a key part of democracy. You must have a free press, you must have an honest press in order for a country uh, to be truly democratic. Mm -hmm. And where are you headed next? Well, there's, there's a lot going on right now in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to be spending probably most of the summer documenting the political situation, which is uh, the political two presidents campaign. running for president. It's an incredibly important election, not only obviously for the United States, but for the world. Uh, but I'll also probably wind up in Haiti, uh, which is a country I've been documenting for over 30 years. Uh, they're in a very difficult situation, and it, it needs people need to be paying attention to what's happening there as well. And who's going to win in the U.S., Trump or Biden? That's a good question. I don't think anybody <laughs> can tell you at this point. It's too early to tell. Too early to tell. It's been a pleasure having you in, on Rubicon, Ron Hadid. Oh, I appreciate you. it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Rubicon me Adriatic Kelmendin per krahet nga Albimol, Interex, Palma, The Arionic Company.